Hi, I'm Brandon Jacobs, and I'm honored that Dr. Studi asked me here today to share my story with you. The last several years have not been very fun for me health-wise. In 2009, I was diagnosed with that multiple sclerosis. I was not even 40 years old and facing a chronic and life-changing disease that I would have to deal with and manage for the rest of my life. Things went through my head like I would be able to walk my daughter, who was five at the time, down the aisle. With the great support system, comprised of friends and family, I kept on with my life, work, playing with my daughter, going out with friends, and vacationing because who knew how long I would be able to do these things. A few years after the MS diagnosis, I was at work and suffered severe chest pains and shortness of breath. I thought that I was having a heart attack and that I was about to die. After being admitted to the hospital, I was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. I went home on warfarin, um, an oral blood thinner, due to the increased risk of blood clots, that is, no complication of a pain. <coughs> Maintaining therapeutic level on warfarin was a challenge, and there were a lot of downsides that went with it. Couldn't eat certain foods, I had to go to the doctor's office um, for blood work several times a week. They were continuously changing my dose based on my latest results. These things might sound minor to most, but to me, a young working father who's trying to adjust all of this while trying to manage my MX and live a normal life it was not mine. It was overwhelming. I spoke to my cardiologist and described her dad's explaining that it should make things easier for me. Not long after I started her dad's I was home one afternoon and started having chest pains and trouble breathing again. After being brought to my local hospital, I was told this time my pain was not caused by the AFib, but a, by a large pulmonary embolism. Further tests showed that in addition to the clots in my lung, both of my legs were full of clots. The doctors immediately placed a filter into my vena cava to stop any thoughts from breaking off and traveling and performed surgery to remove the thoughts from my legs. After being on a heparin IV in the hospital, I went home on Xarelta because it had different properties that were Daxa and would probably work better for me. While on Xarelta, I developed another blood clot that required me to be hospitalized. Now I had failed both Pradaxa and Zeralta. My doctors determined that I was someone who really just needed to stay on work. It was a pain, but we made it work. What was the alternative? The doctors continued to treat the AFib with multiple cardio conversions and finally a cardiac ablation, and life went on. Realizing that the anticoagulation drugs were not working was not normal. My wife and I decided to get a second opinion and wound up getting an appointment with Dr. Charles Abrams in the hematology department at Penn. He was fantastic and very thorough, but regardless, he was not unable to determine why blood thinners were not working for me and said that many cases like mine, the underlying root cause of the body is never identified. On September 3rd, 2015, in the early morning, I woke up with severe pain in my cell. The pain was so bad I was vomiting. My wife brought me to the local hospital emergency room, and what I thought was a kidney stone wound up being a bleed in my kidney. I was moved to a different hospital, put in my ICU, had surgery to stop the bleeding, and was taking off my blood thinners. Within days, both legs were full of clots. A vascular surgeon went in and tried to remove the clots, but was unable. I resumed my anti-coagulation regime. I was in the hospital and rehab for almost two months, having suffered, suffered many complications during that time. When I did finally return home, my legs were huge. Each one looked like a tree trunk. It was painful to walk or to have my legs down for any length of time. I was kept taking a lot of painkillers for all of the different ailments I was dealing with, including my legs. My mother took me to the vascular surgeon for a follow-up and I, after I had returned home. The surgeon pulled up my scans and told me 
both my legs had chronic clots from my ankles through my pelvis, and that the clots had actually even made its way above my belt. He looked at me and said there was nothing he could do, and basically I should go about living my life until the clots above my filter broke off and traveled to my heart, lung, or brain. I was 44 years old, and I was just going to wait for it to break off and kill me. I was petrified. Upset, I called my wife from the car and told her the doctor what the doctor had said. Her response was that we would not accept that answer. She called Dr. Abrams on his cell phone and explained what happened. Dr. Abrams asked her to bring me to Penn first thing the next morning. During that appointment, Dr. Abrams called down to the interventional radiology and got us in contact with him. When my wife and I met Dr. Sudi for the first visit, we both left the office with the first sense of hope that we had not had in a long time. Dr. Sudi proposed a two-day surgery where he would go in and clean out the pots from both legs. After that, he would remove the filter and rebuild the veins in my legs with stents. His confidence made us confident. A few months later, I was admitted to UPenn and Dr. Sudi performed the surgery. It was not all smooth sailing when Dr. Sudi got in, finding a pediatric stent from a previous surgery that had moved and gotten stuck in my gold. Even with all that, I walked out of the hospital three days later with legs that were free of pockets. The next couple of weeks were tough. There was pain and the swelling remained until all of a sudden, about six weeks post-op, I realized the pain was a lot better and the swelling was almost gone. The difference that this made in my life was beyond anything I could have felt. I was able to wear pants instead of only being able to wear um, able to fit my legs into shorts, um, able to go to my daughter's field hockey games, I'm able to drive from place to place, as well as being able to do other things that most people take for granted on a daily basis. Most of all, I don't live with the sense of dread waiting for a clock to break off and kill me. I have hope for the, I have hope for the rest of my life. If there is nothing else you take away from my story, I am asking you please not to give hope, not to give up hope for your patients when they come to you with a chronic PBT issue. Regardless of how impossible the situation seems, encourage them to not give up and continue to look until they find the person who will be able to help them because there is light at the end of the tunnel, even when the tunnel seems public.